Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting webinar from the Portainer team. Today, I am absolutely thrilled to have two of my favorite humans joining us from two of my favorite companies, not that I'm biased at all. We are having, hosting rather, Brendan O'Leary of GitLab. He's the developer evangelist over there. And we're also joined by Portainer CEO, Neil Creswell. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here with us today. We are stretching time zones and geography all the way from Washington, D.C. to Auckland, New Zealand. How you doing? Very good. Very good. Uh, excited to be here with Brendan. I'm quite a, quite, quite a fanboy of, of uh, I get lab, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah, I'm excited to be here. I'm, I'm a fanboy of Portainer, so it'll just be Perfect. like a... Love Fest will be great. Yes. And and speaking of Love Fest, I appreciate that the first time the three of us actually got to meet in person was at KubeCon down in Los Angeles back in October. It's been an interesting adventure working with both of your companies throughout the last two years, but I am always grateful when we spend time in person or in this case, virtually, and I look forward to the next time. So GitOps is huge in the buzz world right now. I know that Brendan, you've been working in this space. Git is in the GitLab name rather than have me trying to find it. What is GitOps? It's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I kind of like to think about it and maybe it's a little crass, but as like a rebranding of DevOps to be, you know, try it again, <laughs> right? Like trying again to do the thing that we wanted to do when we created the term DevOps in, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Um, but I, I mean, I think at its core, you know, we think of it as requiring three components. One, it requires infrastructure as code, which, you know, isn't new. It requires, you know, the use of a merge request or a pull request as the change mechanism for any infrastructure update and it requires CI CD. So, you know, automating the delivery and the integration of the code into practice. I think at its core, that's kind of the required things to call something GitOps, but you know, those three things aren't new. So that's why I also like to think of it as not necessarily a new practice as much as a, you know, evolution of what we've been trying to do with DevOps for a long time. Yeah, I love that. The TLDR for the non-technical types like me, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's essentially a massive time and cost saver that provides a little more transparency and security, which is fantastic. Neil, we've just released some features to enable GitOps. Enlighten us. Yeah, well, historically, Portain has been all about deploying applications through our web-based forms. Uh, and, and or uh, just uploading or pasting in uh, manifests. And through the need to transition more to a, a GitOps or DevOps and GitOps culture, we, we needed to add support for that kind of capability. So we, we basically have built into Portainer now a embedded GitOps engine, which will connect to Git repos, retrieve manifests, retrieve comp uh, uh, compose files that will let you uh, modify those files deploy them into any cluster that's managed by Portainer, Docker, or Kubernetes, doesn't matter. And it will keep those, th those deployments in sync and a constant loop cycle. So if anything changes in the Git repo, it'll be immediately propagated and pushed live in the cluster. If an admin or a user attempts to make a change to the running configuration, a, a Portainer will override their change uh, in the next next loop cycle, um, you know, in, in, a, in a full GitOps style. So relatively... Uh, straightforward um, you know, uh, design of GitOps, but it, it works, it's really clean, and it is so simple to configure, there is no excuse not, not to use it. I love that. And Brendan, when I started working with Portainer, you were actually already a user of Portainer, right? Yeah, I do. I use it um, in my home lab. I've used it for a long time. Um, and then like I've kind of subtly been an evangelist of it when folks are like, I just don't know what I'm going to do to like manage all these Docker images I've got going. I was like, well, <laughs> you know, Portainer gives you an actual view into it. Um, and so I think it's great to see, um, you know, this, this GitOps 
concept coming because you know it allows Portana, I think, to be you know even more applicable across more enterprises that might say, yes, we love the you know features that we can see what's going on and understand what's really happening, um, but we also need to, like Neil was saying, you know, another key tenant of tenant of GitOps is you know the known state of the cluster is all or the deployment is always going to be um, represented in Git in code, right? And so we don't want folks to uh, you know, stray from that configuration in a way that doesn't end up being, you know, cemented and memorialized in a code change uh, so that there's all the approvals and security that goes along with it. That's really critical, I think. Uh, that's a critical part of GitOps is to make sure that we have those approvals and security considerations whenever we're making a change. We're not just kind of changing something and seeing how it goes, right? We're, we're being very intentional with that. Yeah, absolutely. And actually building on that, since cybersecurity is one of the hottest topics in the world right now, I know that security is something that both of your companies have taken very seriously since day one. So can you tell us a little bit about initial approach and also how you're supporting your respective communities, especially right now? And let's start with Brendan for this one. Yeah, I mean, I think security is something that, you know, Folks have always been concerned about, but you know, you aptly point out that um, you know it's something that it, the world is has a heightened focus on right now, for lots of different reasons, um, and it's kind of been gaining momentum, and then you know recently you know become really critical for a lot of businesses and people alike. Right? We we saw the you know the president of the United States mention <laughs> uh, cybersecurity. Right? That's that's how you know something's really happening. I I had my wife who. Uh, is great, but she's an educator. She couldn't really describe what GitLab does to you very well. But she said to me, "Oh, are you hearing about these like cyber security threats?" I was like, "Oh yes, <laughs> we've been talking about it." And so, like as that strips, uh, as it seeps into the mainstream, you kind of understand like how big of a deal it is for everyone to be thinking about. Um, and so, yeah, that's yeah. been a huge focus of ours, right? Because we have kind of two. You know, two major constituencies there. We have, you know, making sure that GitLab is run securely, our either gitlab.com, our SaaS offering, or that our customers that are running GitLab can run it securely themselves. Uh, and then also, you know, helping people to secure the code they're putting out there, right, through all of our tools. Um, and so we, we recently released a, uh, a blog on kind of like hygiene and best practices for security if you're running uh, GitLab, either if you're using our .com instance, or if you're running your own uh, copy of GitLab um, you know, to kind of think through, wait, have I, how is my high security hygiene for, for this? Um, because it's something that's really critical for everyone. Yeah, talk about the two hottest topics of the last two years, security and hygiene. Mm -hmm. I know that Neil, we came out with something similar, and I know that this is also something you thought about when you started building Portainer from the ground up. Tell us a story. Yeah, well, so, for us, our security has two two dimensions, right? It has the security of Portainer itself, so making sure that only authorized people are logging into Portainer, making sure that those people are only doing authorized actions when they're in Portainer, so making sure that that their their role base access is correct. But more importantly, we're also really focused on uh, ensuring supply chain security, you know, software supply chain security for our, our users as well. So making sure that there's no possible way that, that you know, compromises can be injected into their software supply chain from, from devs committing code through to the code going live in production. And so when, when we built our, our, our GitOps engine, one of the things that we wanted to do differently is we didn't want to run the actual deployment jobs as a service account, as any kind of cluster admin or cluster privileged account. Each user that, that defines a GitOps pipeline, the, the, the pipeline actually runs as that user's identity or within that user's RBAC roles. So it, it means you can really, really tighten down uh, what the actual pipeline to do. So if, if, if you've got three or four or many more different types of pipelines, each needing different levels of security, it's very easy to do that with differing service accounts or whatever you want. So, so the actual GitOps engine itself does not have any service account whatsoever because it does not run in the cluster. It runs inside Portainer itself. So then Portainer's RBAC, Portainer security, all of the, 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 the controls we have around Portainer itself 
help you to make sure that that pipeline is running with the least privilege, that pipeline, not, not GitOps, that pipeline runs with the least privilege. And there's been some well-publicized uh, weaknesses in popular um, GitOps toolings where things have been able to run as part of the pipeline without anyone realizing because of a mistake in coding, mistake in permissions. You know, we've, we've tried to elevate that right out of it and say, we, we don't want to run anything in the cluster. We want it to run in Portainer. We can do checks and balances, least, least privilege go. So, and I, I also published a blog just recently on how to, how to correctly secure your Portainer instance. Um, the number of people who put Portainer live on the internet uh, scares me. Um, there are reasons why you might do that. Uh, if you have Portainer live on the internet, you know, by all means, make sure you have a firewall in front of it that is uh, only allowing access from known trusted IP addresses. Don't just put it live on the internet, any, any allow. Uh, you're just asking for trouble. And we will have links to both of those, both in the comments right now, as well as in the video description and any other place you may be finding this content. Also throughout the course of this, do feel free to drop in any questions that you have for Neil and Brendan. We will do our best to answer them live here. And if you're watching a replay, we'll follow back up in the comments as soon as we can. We always love engaging with you as I'm sure as a member of our community, you know. So when we were doing our prep for this interview, I got excited about the opinions that you both have about this next question. Two of the biggest words in cloud right now are Kubernetes and GitOps. Are they a match made in heaven? Is, is uh, GitOps the only way that people are using Kubernetes? Are people out there managing Kubernetes without GitOps? Talk to me, Neil. So I think that GitOps and Kubernetes have been merged together for one reason, and that one reason is to try and abstract away developers from Kubernetes. You know, Kubernetes is not overly human friendly. It doesn't have a very good developer UX at all. It, it, it just doesn't. And you, you see so many people asking, oh, how, how, can, I, how can I help my developers uh, you know, engage with, with Kubernetes? How can I do this? How can I do this? And it's like, and most times the, the, the answers are, you, your developers shouldn't be interfacing with Kubernetes directly. What they should do is have, have automation pipelines that do everything for them. So they, they have pipelines, building applications. They have, they have tools letting them observe the results of, they should not need to interface with Kubernetes directly. So I think that's why why Kubernetes and GitOps have been merged together is, is to try and try and provide a, a a safety blanket for a really really poor developer UX that Kubernetes provides natively. Now that that doesn't you know obviously Portainer can act as that that developer UX on top of Kubernetes, but at the same time you've got the the, the, the GitOps engine too. So that, that that's my, my my view anyway. And Brendan, I know that you too think that they should not be quite as intrinsically linked as perhaps they are in people's minds. Tell us. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I you know, I can see how they became intrinsically linked, right? Um, the idea of Kubernetes generally is, hey, this is a, you know, we want to set a known um, state and have uh, the system take care of itself to keep that known state good. Um, same idea with GitOps, right? We want to set a known state for our application, right? Uh, and keep that known set good. So in that sense, you know, one is on the infrastructure side, one is on the application side. Uh, and so they, you know, it kind of seems natural to tie the two together. Um, but to Neil's point, like, A, Kubernetes was never really meant to be necessarily the interface for a developer, right? Um, and so B, you know, you do need some sort of, you know, interface to the, for the developer. And that's where you get tools like Portainer. Um, you get lots of folks building on top of uh, Kubernetes as a platform. Uh, and I think, you know, even if you hear Kelsey Hightower talk about Kubernetes, who, who could be more of an advocate for, for Kubernetes than, than him, you know, you'll hear him talk about, you know, Kubernetes is, 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 the, is the distribution, it's the operating system, right? It's like not meant to be the last thing uh, that you know, a user of it or a developer interacts with. There's supposed to be things that, you know, it's supposed to enable us to build on top of it 
uh, in a way that makes developers productive. Um, and so from that perspective, you know, that it doesn't, you know, they don't necessarily have to be a purist and say like the two are intrinsically linked. I also think there's lots of, um, you know, cause there's ways to use Kubernetes without GitOps. But I also think there's ways to use GitOps without Kubernetes. And that maybe is even more controversial. Like I think the concept of having a known state in Git and having an agent which makes sure or process by which we make sure uh, that that stays, you know, the known state. Um, I think that applies in, you know, places where Kubernetes doesn't, right? There's lots, you know, Kubernetes will not be the only place we're shipping code ever, right? There's embedded devices, there's um, the edge, there's IoT, there's lots of different places that we are gonna ship code. Many of them are running Kubernetes today. And Kubernetes is in weird places, right? Jaguar Land Rover talks about it being in the car's uh, uh, dashboard. Um, but I don't think that means that it's going to be everywhere. And so I think that that concepts of GitOps can apply even outside of, of Kubernetes. Yeah, that, that, that was one of the reasons why we, we were so inclined to bring the, our, our GitOps feature to Docker as well. Because uh, I would say still the, gra the, greatest, um, the greatest proportion of devs still develop locally using Docker, not Kubernetes. And mm -hmm. if, if you really want to bring the benefits of GitOps across the entire organization, you need to, to bring GitOps right down to the actual devs machine. So with, with, with Portana running on a devs laptop, they, they've got a full GitOps engine built in right there. And, and they, they can actually link their local machine to GitOps pipelines back, you know, with, with, without having to have the huge overhead or complexity and it's for Docker, not Kubernetes. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So the pace of change in the Kubernetes space, since we're talking about it, seems to be moving at hyperspeed. It's very hyped. Do you believe the hype? Is it, is it accurate? Is, uh, are we gonna see a lot of change over the next few years? What trends do you think are gonna emerge? Neil, I think you've got an answer on the tip of your tongue. I, I struggle to keep up with the pace of change. Um, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's intriguing uh, how many new Kubernetes tools come out uh, almost on a daily basis. I, I, yeah, our, our internal Slack channel is, is just constantly bing, bing, binging of, of new, new, new notices of cool tools that people have found. It's like, man, could there be any more tools? It, it seems to me... Kubernetes has a lot of quirks and people are trying to write a, 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 a bespoke tool to address a quirk. And so because there are so many quirks, there are so many bespoke tools. So you've got this, this constant churn of tools coming out the market to solve one particular problem. You know, that, that, that's, that's, that's just a minefield uh, of, of tools out there to try, to try and look at. And again, look at, look at the, the CNCF landscape. There's what, 1,069, you know, people or, or companies on, on that landscape. If you said how many actual applications, not companies, oh my goodness, it would be, be way more than that. So to, to try and keep pace, and if, if you were an organization just starting new with Kubernetes, you say, right, okay, I'm gonna do Kubernetes, it's Friday, I wanna do Kubernetes, and I wanna try and go live with something on Monday or, you know, or, or e even, even a month from now opening up that landscape and saying, right, well, I, I need a logging tool. I need a tool for observability. And, it, and it's like, woo, I've got 20 logging tools to choose from. I've got 50 things in observability. And it's like, we, we, where do you begin? So it, it, it's, it's quite an quite a overwhelming landscape to, to, to be in. And all of those tools are evolving at a rapid pace. And there are new tools coming on board at a rapid pace. I just can't imagine what that landscape is going to look like in six, 12, you know, 18 months time. It's just going to be a mess. And I think there has to be some uh, consolidation of tooling down because otherwise it's just going to get out of control. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think, I think we see these kind of cycles sometimes. Um, I think we saw it in the DevOps tool space, you know, this similar, you know, if you look back uh, six, 10 years, you know, this massive explosion, maybe not as massive, right? Each one maybe gets bigger than the last because as Neil said, the, the CNCF landscape is unmatched mm -hmm. for its, uh, its size. But, um, you know, I think we see this, this, this kind of explosion of tooling and then convergence, right? Um, into, you know, use cases that make sense. And I think we're already maybe starting to see that tipping point at the CNCF and, and in, in cloud native in general. Um, 
you know, I, I could be biased. You know, I'm all, I sit on the CNCF board, so like I could be biased to that. But I, I think we're starting to see that. Like we're seeing members and projects that get more focused into like, okay, what's the like telecom use case for right Kubernetes? What, what's the edge use case for cloud native? And so I think as those use cases become more clear, uh, we'll see that rubber band kind of come back and consolidate. Like we've seen in dev tools, right? We've seen this consolidation of dev tools into um, platforms that kind of bring a lot of those things together, right? I think we'll see that platform thing happening uh, in the Kubernetes space. And again, that's one thing that makes me excited about Portainer. I think, you know, Portainer has the ability to, to be one of those platforms. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that that is, you know, the way that we'll see the, that rubber band come back. Because right now, like Neil said, it's kind of like in, unsustainably stretched <laughs> um, because there's no way, you know, any one person could be an expert on, you know, the 120 projects that are part of the CNCF or the, you know, thousands of members and, and other tools that are on the the uh, the landscape. And so I think we'll see that that come back, right? We, we have to remember the CNCF only, you know, started in 20, what, 2015, 2016 with like four projects, five projects, right? Kubernetes, Prometheus, like Envoy, I think maybe Container D, um, but it's like now, you know, just a few years later expanded to where it is. And so I think we'll necessarily see that kind of convergence towards a platform approach, but, you know, that may take, you know, that may have the same amount of time that it, it took to grow up. So it could get worse, quote unquote, before it gets better in terms of like how much there is to try and know. Uh, but I think we'll see that kind of natural ebb and flow happen that we've seen happen uh, in tooling before. Yeah, that, that, that's been, been one of our, our core focuses is, and I, sometimes this term is uh, seen in negative light, but I, I like Portana to be the actual training wheels um, for, for getting, getting people in and started and operationally efficient with Kubernetes. Um, you know, we, we, we have to be the tool that you deploy, you know, the platform that you deploy that just works. You can you you can install us on a Friday. You can be be going live with with deployments on a Monday, because we've got everything natively built into Voltana that you need to 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 get going. Um, that doesn't mean that we're only good for for the first ninety days. Not at all. Yeah. But, but what we've focused on is the UX to just get going. So you you can get going quickly and efficiently. And as you grow, as your needs change. Sure, you might phase out of some of Portainer's built-in features, but that, that's why we, we focused on having a, a full Kube API proxy so you can plug other you know, specialist tools into Portainer and then have Portainer for core authentication and access management and then other tools like, like Argo or GitLab's own GitOps engine coming in and, and managing you know, GitOps through Portainer as you outgrow our, our ones. But... Yeah, you know, the real focus is just get started and get started efficiently. Brennan, I know that GitLab has a similar history of approach and that the, the training wheels metaphor really aligned with you guys as well. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think like, like uh, you're saying, it's maybe not a great term, right? <laughs> you don't want to necessarily make either folks think your tool is training wheels or that they need training wheels you know, like that kind of can have a negative connotation. It's not that it's, it's that this is a very complex, um, you know, uh, space as we just talked about <laughs> uh, to get into. And so, you know, getting started can be the hardest thing having, you know, I, I always talk about this when I'm, when I'm working with uh, like my bosses or, or uh, anyone that's like writing, it's like, so the blank sheet of paper is the hardest th time it is to start writing. Right. Once you have something written down, you can iterate on that, you can change it, you can make it better, but going from zero to something is the hardest part. And so I think it is important um, that if we do as an industry believe in Kubernetes and cloud native, that we you know, respect the fact that it's a very complex system, but also make the onboarding not you know, so uh, onerous on folks that are trying to learn it that they just give up or worse, uh, you know, set it up in a way that's not secure from the get go or set it up in a way that, you know, isn't going to be sustainable in the long term. Uh, and so, you know, we had, a, we had a concept of that. We had this concept of auto DevOps and it was, you know, it is like this, you know, concept of you commit your code and we 
detect the language and we build it and we dockerize it for you and we deploy it. Um, and you know, for a lot of engineers, they look at that and they go, oh, well, but I want to control exactly, you know, how these things, I want this, you know, I overheard the other day someone say a, a handcrafted artisanal Docker file, um, right? Like, <laughs> like I want that. And it's like, that's okay once you have that expertise. Um, and so we built that in a pluggable way, you know, similar to what Neil's describing, where, well, spoiler alert, what it is underneath is it's all built on the primitives of GitLab, right? And so you can take those primitives, um, small primitives and change them and adapt them or, you know, throw them away and bring your own. Um, so I think that that is how you take a very complex system like a Kubernetes or, you know, DevOps pipeline uh, and make it so that folks can get started without, you know, having to learn everything there is to learn uh, about that complex system um, and set them up for success. Otherwise, it's like you're going to have a lot of fits and starts. You're going to do something and not realize it's bad until, you know, the CEO is on the other end of the line saying, hey, why did, why did someone just send me a you know, all of our uh, data from our Kubernetes cluster, right? Like to, to Neil's point of like, don't put it on the internet if you don't know what you're doing. Um, you know, that that kind of thing is definitely something you want to help people avoid. You want to give them a path where they can be successful uh, and then grow as they grow in their understanding of the system. So I was, just, I was just thinking maybe, maybe, maybe a better term for training wheels is actually um, bootstrapping. So bootstrapping your actual mm -hmm. adoption of this of, of the technology. Maybe maybe that's actually a smarter way of, of describing it. Yeah. I think one of the because it's like the... I was saying, it's hard because like training wheels, in the end, it's like it's like a fighter jet or it's like a you know, a, a you know, aircraft. Yeah, you know, the, the complexity of the system is is so large that training wheels almost doesn't Never capture it correctly. <laughs> yeah. I like that. You could have like paper airplane to fighter jet. You could also have, you know, I, one of the terms I use with, with technology or even training founders is, is uh, bumpers on the bowling lane. So you'll still figure out yeah. how to use this, but you're not going to end up having this horrible first experience or this really uncomfortable first experience. And you're allowed to make mistakes and, and learn quickly rather than having to figure out how to throw it perfect every time down the mm. lane yeah. and to, in order to get a strike. So it gives you a lot that. That's what I'm here for, Neil. That's why I love working with me. <laughs> it's, it's all progress. And bowling is nice. You, know, you get more tries, you commit and code. I'm learning, man. Y'all teach me a lot every time in one of these. Some, someday, someday I'll be technical before, <laughs> before we know it. Uh, shifting directions a little bit, but in the same vein. Uh, we talk a lot about how GitOps is great for a lot of things. Is it great for prod? Neil, I know you have thoughts. I always have thoughts. Um, is it great <laughs> for prod? I it it depends. It depends on the type of application. If it if it's just an application that is scalable, deployed everywhere, it's stateless. Uh, it, it's it's highly resilient because you've got multiple copies of it deployed in multiple different regions, multiple different clusters. Is it good for prod? There, absolutely. That's to that's totally fine. Because if if something goes wrong with the deployment and and it, and one of the environments goes down, would your end users really uh, really notice? Probably not. If it is managing an application that is that is far closer to a monolith than a true a twelve factor cloud native application, mm, I'd I'd be I'd be thinking twice. Um, unless you unless you can accept that sometimes bugs will slip through then I probably wouldn't be, do, wouldn't be doing it live in production. You know, it, it was one of the reasons why with Portainer's GitOps feature, we actually added a, a little, little button called enable change window. And it's like, well, hang on a second. Isn't that the complete inverse of what GitOps is supposed to be? GitOps is supposed to be get, make it live right now. Uh, we, we actually said, well, hang on a second, not, not, not everybody. So you can actually turn on a switch to say change window and the, the actual GitOps automation only occurs within the change window. Outside of the change window, it's all paused. It's all suspended. You know, when, when it comes in the change window, it'll catch up, but it's paused. Now it's like, well, that that's done for a reason. That's done to, to prevent a, a dev accidentally pushing something live that gets approved, that ends up in production at 11.59 a.m. on Black Friday sale day. That's when you don't want things happening. So we, we've said, well, if, if you want prod, no problem, but here is an actual safety net because we're all about safety nets. Here's a safety net just in case. I see a lot of nods coming from you, Brendan. Do you, you agree? 
Yeah, I, t- I totally agree. I think, you know, it's a great, with great power comes great responsibility thing. You know, that's true of GitOps, it's true of Kubernetes. Uh, it gives you this power to uh, change things very quickly, but the problem is that also gives you the power to break things very quickly, right? Uh, and so you have to be very intentional about how you implement it. It's not, GitOps is not great for prod if you're just learning about it today from Neil and I and decide to go do it tomorrow. <laughs> um, GitOps is great for prod <laughs> if you've thoughtfully considered, you know, all of the constraints that are placed on your application and your service. Um, and decide, hey, this is the way that we need to be able to adapt quickly uh, to changes. Uh, and we need to value that over necessarily um, stability. Not that, not that GitOps is by its nature less stable, but you know, it's going to be more changes. Um, and so like Neil said, if you have a stateless application that's got lots of copies, well, then it's probably great for that because you wanna be moving that kind of always, right? It's gonna always be moving and changing and it's a much more dynamic system. Uh, so yeah, I would agree completely. Nice. Well, then it's sorted, folks. There's your <laughs> there's your lesson on GitOps, <laughs> GitOps and fraud. <laughs> uh, let's talk about GitOps versus ClickOps and their role in automation. I learned from both of you actually in talking about this yesterday. So, Brendan, what what? what's the order of operations that you advise or uh, prefer see people using a lot? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't know if there's like a necessarily a straight order of operations, but I, I would say that I think both have their role. Um, you know, you have to understand what's happening. And if the way to get there is through, you know, a user interface that shows you and makes you understand what's going to happen, then great. Um, but I do think in the end, um, whether it's through GitOps or some other method, you want to build automation that can be, um, you know, solidified in a way that is, is changed, not necessarily through anyone clicking around, but through, you know, a structured process of change, right? That's, again, the thing that we talked about earliest when I was defining GitOps is why it's positive, you know, it's this ability to have everything documented in the repository, and the point of change is the merge request or pull request that we always are used to. Uh, so I think you want to get to that point, but you don't want to necessarily also just, again, hand someone a blank sheet of paper with a .yaml extension and say, okay, have fun with GitOps, right? Like, I don't, I don't think that's a, a method for success either. Um, so I think they both kind of play that role in understanding what are the things that we need to automate and then, you know, automating where it makes sense, not just for automation's sake, if that, if that kind of ties it in. Yeah, absolutely. It's being thoughtful about what you're doing and, and how you're optimizing all the tools in, in your processes, frankly. And no, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Neil, you touched on how automation creation can be a barrier with GitOps yesterday when we were talking about an, an, an opportunity for ClickOps. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I think the word understand is going to be the word of the day today because it it actually is yeah, imperative that you that you understand how your application needs to be deployed and how it operates when it is deployed. So you you, you actually go through a process of of you know writing your code, building your your, your Docker files, building your manifests, or or just getting it live into the environment through a ClickOps UI. So just get it live. How does it behave when I when I want to do updates? You know, do, do, does my application actually support rolling updates, or do I need to treat it more like a stateful application and roll updates in a very prescribed order? You know, how how do I need to handle this? How many how many of them can I can I upgrade at the same time before before it's a real problem? So you can you can use ClickOps to to you know through a process of trial and error to figure out the the best behavior for the application. Once once you know that then you can go and, and codify what you just learned. Now, right now, we're, we're actually working on, on, a, on a feature that will let you use Portainer's front-end you know, clickable UI to help you build the actual GitOps codes and manifests for you, push it to a repo, and then follow through to deploy it. So you, you can actually learn through the ClickOps UI once, once you've learned enough save what you've learned as a manifest, push it to a Git repo, and then commence the process of deployment through GitOps. 
so it, it's really it's really important that you that you understand the behavior, understand the actual um, uh, intrinsic nature of your application's behavior before you just go jumping straight in and automating it. What do you think is the biggest myth about GitOps right now, or the or the since we're talking about understanding, what do you think is something that you that you either wish more people understood or that you think would be really beneficial for folks to understand about GitOps? It's only as good as the scripts that it gets fed. So I I, I think I think there is this 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 myth that it is this miracle cure and it's going to take any application and get it running amazingly in production all the time, like magic. Magic happens when, when, when keyboards are on, when, when, when fingers are on keyboards creating code, uh, rubbish in, rubbish out. So you need to make sure that, that whoever is creating the automation knows exactly what they're doing. Otherwise you're in for a wild ride. You also are nodding again, Brendan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I would, I would agree. The thing I would say is like, again, it, it makes me think back to, you know, my, my kind of uh, crass definition of GitOps as the new DevOps or, you know, as a rebranding of DevOps. It's like nine, none of these things can happen in a vacuum. Um, they're not, you know, a software solution to all of your problems to, you know, the problems that you have with process or people, right? You know, a, a system is made up of people, process, and tools, and no tool is going to make up for, um, you know, an issue in your process, right? Oh, we don't move code fast enough because, you know, security is completely separate from our team and we they're never looped in on the changes we want to make, right? GitOps doesn't just magically fix that problem in your organization. You've got to bring security in and, and understand um, you know, where they, what they need to feel comfortable with, you know, changes. So, um, or, you know, if the people, right, to Neil's point, if they don't understand how the system really works, GitOps is not going to make it better. It's going to make it worse, right? It's going to take them further away from, from what the system is really doing in production and understanding how it's behaving uh, and how it's reacting to what's going on. Uh, and so in that sense, I think the number one thing to remember is, um, as much as Neil or I would like to sell you the thing that would solve all of your problems, <laughs> the software will never be all of it. You've got mm -hmm. to also consider the, the people in the process. Absolutely. I think that's actually something that you both do very well. And I know that you are community forward and community first type of people because it's a fun question for me to ask towards the end of our interview. What role does Twitter play in your jobs? Because just for the audience, both of these gentlemen are very active on Twitter. They engage with the humans that use their products and answer a lot of questions at a lot of different hours of the day from what I've seen on both sides. So is Twitter more DevOps or GitOps? And forgive my bad technical puns. <laughs> Crikey, is Twitter more, mm. more DevOps or GitOps? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's how do you even know how to answer that question? Uh, <laughs> Twitter, Twitter is a, a influx uh, of, of very, very valuable uh, feedback from users, positive and negative. Um, is, it, is, it, is it GitOps or DevOps? I have no way to even begin to, to comprehend how to, how to translate that. Brendan, give that a go. Yeah. That's a good one. I'm trying to think, you know, I actually do have, I use um, a tool called Buffer for Twitter that like buffers feeds for me. And so maybe that's kind of like, that's like Twitter as code or GitOps maybe. I guess that's the closest thing I could I could think of. Um, although, um, you know, I, I, um, I, I like to define DevOps. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the comic XKCD, um, but it's this like kind of really nerdy comic um, like one of the famous ones is someone names their son like a SQL statement that makes the school drop their SQL table um, for students. But there's, there's lots of them. And it says it's a web comic of romance, sarcasm, math, and language. Um, and so I like to say that that's what DevOps is. Um, and so I'm going to say that Twitter is that too. So, so Twitter is more DevOps. So it, was, it was a long jump to get there, but that's that's what I'm gonna. I'm, I'm gonna stick with that. Uh, I was just saying uh, that for me, I, th I think I think Twitter is is DevOps and Reddit is GitOps. 
I, I, think, <laughs> I think I think that's that's the difference actually because you know Reddit oh, okay. is instantaneous right now, whereas whereas DevOps is, is is quite asynchronous. So yeah, yeah, that's it. That's about the best I can come up with. Yeah, I like it. See, for me, not that anyone asked me, but in my opinion, <laughs> because I would see email or some of the other forms of communication as more DevOps and longer process flow, but Twitter being this very succinct thing that I can delete or undo when occasionally necessary, more for the typo, not for change in perspective. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's fun to think about Speaking of, where can people find both of you on Twitter, Brendan, if you don't mind sharing your handle? Yeah, yeah, I'm at O'Leary Crew, so O-L-E-A-R-Y-C-R-E-W on Twitter. And, you know, I didn't ask the answer really what a, play, a role plays in my job. It's actually part of my uh, key performance indicators for my job, so feel free to, to help me out a little. <laughs> Hey, I, I, <laughs> hey, can I ask actually digging in on that? Cause that, that's kind of actually almost answering. You're, we're still on the is Twitter DevOps. <laughs> I will make this somehow relevant in this panel, I promise. So what, how are, what is the, the, the OKR, the exactly tied to Twitter as a performance metric for you at GitLab? Yeah. So we look at impressions, right? So our, our team is responsible for getting GitLab's name out there and engaging with our community. Um, and one of the ways we measure that is impressions and Twitter is a um, easy to measure impression machine. <laughs> so we, uh, we track those measures and uh, I can tell you all of our team's impressions on Twitter for the past you know months, uh, something we talk about. So is this the only reason you and GitLab are nice to me on Twitter? Did I, is this one of those moments where- oh, Well, here's the thing. I'm not always nice on list. Twitter either. Like I also, I also am, am very much one of those people that needs to disclaim their Twitter that it's not, you know, the opinions of the company because sometimes I'll get a little spicy about other things that aren't related. Um, but hey, you know, all engagement's good engagement, right, Savvy? So, you know, that's what- <laughs> Uh, yeah, you you know how I feel about it. Uh, I won't bore anyone <laughs> with the things that I tweet or share on my social media, but let's just say it's also very spicy. So so nothing wrong there. Neil, how can folks find you in the Twitterverse? So I'm actually behind the Portainer IO Twitter 99% of the time. So uh, I, I like to say that uh, my opinions are the opinions of, of the company. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, spicy or otherwise, uh, you, you'll find me often uh, at the shock of marketing, uh, driving the uh, Portana Twitter handle. Now, I, I have my own, uh, Neil C underscore cloud, uh, but predominantly I'm actually directly tweeting as uh, Portana IO. I can attest to the fact that he is behind Portana <laughs> IO as well, and, and that it is a great way to, to reach either of these humans. If you have a follow up question or you're watching this replay or you want to help, Brendan with his KPIs. We could all use, <laughs> use help looking good in, in front of our bosses. And speaking of, you know, if you want to tell everyone what a great moderator I am of these panels, no, I'm just kidding. That's, that's, we're not taking it that far. <laughs> uh, in terms of what's coming next or any calls to action, Brendan, I know it's been an extremely exciting couple of months for GitLab. For folks who may not be aware, you IPO'd about six months ago. And congratulations again to you and, and the team. Uh, that's a huge milestone. What's, what's coming next for you and for GitLab that you can share publicly? Thank you. Yeah, really excited. Um, yeah, we're, I'm excited for the uh, GitLab 15.0 release. We've been talking about that a little bit and kind of um, uh, prepping folks for that. Like if you log on to GitLab.com, you get a notification about that. Um, so there's a lot of really cool features coming. As you know, Savvy, but maybe not everyone does, we release on the 22nd of every month. Um, and so sometimes releases can kind of seem like, uh, uh, you know, kind of dull and ordinary because they are, as we do it every month. Um, but, you know, any major release is a time to, to, you know, really look back and reflect on what you've done. And so we're, we're, I'm excited to see that come out uh, in the next couple of months here. I love, I love that. There's actually just a shameless plug. If you want more GitLab and a savvy content, I've both interviewed Sid, their CEO, 
right around when the pandemic was kicking off in March of 2020, as well as Darren Murph, their very famous and beloved head of remote, also for South by Southwest uh, last May and numerous other times, big fan of the GitLab community and your approach and the way that you welcome people like me to your conferences every year. So thank you for that. And uh, Neil actually, and we'll talk about what's coming next, but this is actually appropriate. We've had a question from the audience regarding two-factor authentication. What's the future for us with Portainer there? So Portainer has our own internal auth engine, and that internal auth engine we recommend is only used for non-prod, sandpit, getting started type deployments. And we, we have built into Portainer uh, support for external authentication. So you basically... Uh, delegate the, the the role of authentication to an external provider, LDAP, Active Directory, Microsoft Azure, Google Auth, uh, any any kind of Git Auth provider. You can you can basically delegate or de delegate the the, the actual um, authentication mechanism to that external trusted provider. That is what we recommend people use in production. It's in both the CE version and the paid version. So it's not something that is only available to to paying customers. It's in both. When you configure that, the if, if that if that provider supports 2FA authentication, then Portainer will support 2FA authentication. So that is how I recommend people turn on a two-factor auth with Portainer. Don't try and do it without our internal auth. We won't be bringing it to that because that's not designed for production. Turn on external authentication, link it to a trusted auth provider, turn on complicated passwords, two-factor authentication, all of that stuff with that provider, absolutely. Perfect. All right. Well, looking at our YouTube comments, that sums it up for our community questions today. Neil, where can people find out more about Portainer and upcoming feature announcements? Uh, everything is, is driven off the website. Uh, join the community. Uh, of Portainer, and if, if you want to hear about the latest latest things happening, we, we we've got regular newsletters that we send out and and explain what's coming. You know, the uh, KubeCon EU is coming up very soon, and we're we're having having a push for a whole bunch of really really cool new features and functions for KubeCon. So I'm not going to to, to give any teasers away right now, but uh, expect great things for KubeCon. Um, we do have a, a new version coming out uh, within the next week or so, which is going to be adding support for the Nomad Orchestrator, uh, which is which is pretty cool. That's something that I'm I'm quite excited about. Um, it shows that Portainer genuinely is a, a universal um, container management platform because it doesn't matter Docker, Kubernetes, or Nomad, uh, and yeah, more to come. So excited by that, but excited by excited to be in Valencia which is a long way away from New Zealand um, for KubeCon EU. You know, while it might be a long flight, I'm not sure that the sympathy level is mm -mm. too high from <laughs> anyone on this call. We do look forward to the full report. Brendan, will you be in Valencia for that KubeCon? I uh, am going to be in sunny Valencia, Spain for that cube gun. So whoa, I'm very whoa, whoa, excited whoa. as well. I'm the only one <laughs> in Valencia on this call. I'm trying to bring the sunshine with the blazers, <laughs> dropping a couple hints, Neil. Uh, well, that's lovely. You two will have to get together and, and celebrate and have, have a moment. Uh, Brendan, where can people find out more about GitLab if they are not already yeah. first? Sure, about that GitLab.com. Um, you know, come check it out. Uh, you can get to... Uh, GitLab.com, which is our SaaS version. You can download GitLab and run it yourself, uh, or you can join our community and uh, see what's going on there. Fantastic. I believe both companies are also hiring right now, as well as having skills with these products is always an asset for some of the top companies. We love seeing that on LinkedIn. Brendan and Neil, thank you so much for your time today, for educating us, for 
being inspiring, for teaching us about security hygiene and providing some very fantastic perspectives on GitOps. We'll have all of those resources mentioned in the comments, as well as we'll keep an eye for any of your questions that come in throughout the day. Thank you very much to the Portainer community. We love creating content like this, and you're the reason that we are here. My name is Savannah Peterson, and I hope that you are having a fantastic day and that you and your family are safe. Cheers. Thank you.